Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Thank you, Emily, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? As a big fan of vinyl records, I discovered in our technology gallery that vinyl records are classified according to their size and how quickly they spin on a turntable. So the 78s are called that because they need to spin at 78 revolutions per minute in order for them to play. Well, see, there you go. Fantastic. We discover something new every day when you yes. work at Discovery Park. So thank you for that. I'm excited to welcome today's special guest, uh, Sean Pitts. Um, he's been a pivotal player with arts in McNary County, and he also um, is a fantastic writer. And um, he's got all kinds of irons in the fire. So we're gonna we're gonna learn all about that. Welcome, Dr. Pitts. Thanks so much. It's great to be with you. So before we dive in uh, to all that, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you come from? Uh, what what laid the groundwork for what you're doing today? Well, I was born in, in McNary County. And as a matter of fact, um, I was talking with somebody about this the other day. Uh, um, my day job is I'm a, I'm a chiropractor, and people uh, probably don't always uh, know that about me. They associate me uh, in other parts of the state with the arts and humanities and that sort of thing. And, but that is my day job. And uh, um, I was the first uh, um, person admitted to any level of privileges at the McNary County General Hospital who was born in that hospital. Uh, so just right down the road from where my clinic is now, uh, the um, um, uh, I grew up in McNary uh, County. I was born, as, as I said, in the, uh, the hospital in Selmer and uh, went to school at Adamsville High School uh, just across the way here and uh, had a had a great upbringing in a tight-knit small town, great family. Uh, and we, uh, 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 we, uh, when I say we, my wife and I, Joanna, I moved back uh, to McNary County after um, chiropractic school and started a practice uh, 30 years ago in Selmer, uh, Tennessee. In fact, we're just coming through our 30th uh, year in practice here in Selmer. And uh, uh, so uh, it's been great uh, to be part of the fabric of the business community and the healthcare community here in McNary County. Uh, but uh, midway, uh, sort of in those endeavors about 20 years ago, uh, we uh, we got uh uh, a little concerned that there wasn't a lot in the way of um, offerings for organized arts efforts in the county. We had a young family at the time, and uh, so uh, that's one of those situations that Joanna was from Hardin County, just across the river uh, down in this end of the state. Uh, she had been involved in various uh, creative endeavors, and I had to some of the things that you mentioned, uh, visual arts and music and uh, she had been involved in theater and so we we sort of were this <clears throat> young artistic family uh and so looking around i wanted to our kids to have those opportunities uh, and there wasn't a lot going on in in terms of organized uh arts programs in the community so we started arts mcnary that you mentioned at the top of the program and uh uh and just now uh is uh we're in our 20th anniversary uh, season and that's been uh uh, really uh, a labor of love, uh, but it's been a very joyful thing for our family. My oldest daughter said to me one time that uh, it was uh, uh, it was a unique experience growing up in the house with an arts agency, uh, and that's really how that started on the front end. That, you know, that started at our kitchen table with friends and uh, artists and interested uh, community members, uh, and and it has grown into a you know very fine. Uh, uh, a local arts agency that serves uh, this, uh, whole region and down into North Mississippi. Uh, so we we have a 
uh, we've had a great experience doing those things. We've uh, we've really uh, we've really enjoyed the work, and that's you know provided opportunities for us to be involved in the larger arts community in the state. Uh, uh, and so that's been that's been fun too. Uh, so that's that's the basic story. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that in just a minute. Sure. But first, I'm curious. Um, you obviously have many talents that range, you know, in everything from the arts to organization to community uh, involvement. I see the guitar there. Um, yeah. You're a chiropractor. So so back me up to when you were growing up, uh, what did mm -hmm. your parents do to foster all those activities? Uh, that's that's a great uh, question. My mother and I were just talking about that Uh um, not long ago, uh, that I was sort of the oddball in my family, that uh, uh, they weren't really actively involved in arts or music or, or anything like that. I have one older brother, and uh, he, was, he was a horseman, uh, very involved in equestrian sports and uh, and those sorts of things. And, you know, I like horses, I like to ride, but uh, I was the kid, you know, in the corner sketching, uh, you know, noodling on the piano with a guitar and that kind of thing. Uh, and, um, uh, I don't know really where that came from. Uh, uh, there was nobody in, in my immediate family that, that was involved in, uh, in any of those things. But uh, one thing I didn't appreciate at the time is that uh, I was never treated like the oddball in my family, uh, that uh, my mother and father both encouraged all of those things. Uh, they made sure that I had paint and sketch pads and pencils and whatever I, I needed for that. Uh, you know, I, I started playing drums when I was eight years old and that, that didn't just materialize. I begged for drums and they finally, you know, bought me a set and encouraged, you know, that uh, music and, uh, uh, and never, you know, uh, never certainly stood in the way. And in fact, uh, facilitated and enabled those things, uh, you know, and uh, and and seemed to appreciate appreciate them as did as did my brother, uh, and so uh, that that was um, uh, I think that's a, a unique experience uh, uh, that a lot of people maybe have have had, but nobody really talks about is that you know sort of being the art kid, you know, in in a non artistic uh, family, uh, and it doesn't turn out as well for everybody as it did. For me, you know, in the community organizing part of it, uh, you know, uh, uh, that that sort of evolved on the same track. We, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we just knew we, uh, that we felt like the community could uh, respond better to creatives and provide, you know, better opportunities for creatives. Uh, but we didn't know how to start an arts council. And, you know, we were making it up as we went along uh, to a degree, but we were encouraged, you know, by friends and family and the community. Uh, to, to pursue those things and uh, uh, and it it's all turned out um, really w well you know for me personally and yeah, I think for the community as, as well it's uh, there's a bit of serendipity uh, in the whole uh, in the whole thing uh, but sometimes uh, things work out uh, better without uh, um, you know all the planning and and, uh, and and all that if you just uh, are committed to the cause so now you um, when you were a high school student, Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out which path to take in life, what ultimately led you down the path to becoming a chiropractor instead of a musician or an art teacher? Yeah, uh, uh, I had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with my father when I was in, in college one time. And I didn't really know which direction I was going. I was in an engineering program at the time. I thought I might be an architect, and that's a creative uh, um, um, you know, endeavor, uh, which... Uh, uh, which is more engineering than art, but but still, uh, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I was playing in the band at the time, and I remember saying to my father, well, this might be something that would work out. This, And he's like, well, it might be something that would work out. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you're uh, uh, when you're a starving musician or artist, uh, uh, you're not going to feed yourself. You're you planning on putting your feet under my table, you know, uh, that kind of conversation. So I thought a little bit uh, more about it, and I had, I had seen a chiropractor. In fact, uh, 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 my father-in-law to be, uh, uh, was a chiropractor, uh, but we were of course unmarried at, at the time. So I'd seen him with a, a neck injury. And so he kind of encouraged me in that way. And, uh, and I knew other folks in the field. And so, uh, I wound up, um, uh, going that, going that path in undergraduate school. And, uh, it's been, it's been great. I mean, it's been a good career choice uh, for me. It suits me temperamentally, I think. And, uh, 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 and also, you know, it provided us with the resources to be able to do some of these community things, you know, working for yourself, 
uh, you can, you know, schedule, you know, your own day. And that's provided me opportunities since I was, you know, had the resources to, to, to pursue some of these things and, and the extra time that I could build into my own schedule. So, you know, it worked out, it worked out well on all, on, on all scores, really. Well, side note, I'm a huge proponent of uh, chiropractors. Um, I don't know if you know Dr. Don Cole in Memphis and the Cole oh, yeah. family. I do. Yeah. They're they're legendary uh, family in chiropractic in the state. Yeah, yeah, they're good good uh, personal friends of ours. My wife, when we first got married, she worked for Cole Chiropractic. Oh, I see. Um, I see. Yeah, yeah. So we we go way back, but yeah, no, I've I'm a uh, and then here in Union City, Dr. Ross. Um, Mm -hmm. I had sciatica really bad and Dr. Ross saw me three or four times. This is an, an unsolicited endorsement. Um, (laughs) I saw Dr. Ross three or four times and I'm not kidding you. He saved my life. No more sciatica. I mean, you know, so I'm a huge, uh, supporter of the lack of pain that you can live with once you start seeing chiropractors. Well, Dr. Ross appreciates it and I do too. (laughs) (laughs) Good. So explain to us a little bit, uh, what you and your wife found, uh, 20 years ago. For those of us who don't know much about McNary County or for people who are listening, who've never even heard of it, uh, describe the County a little bit as it existed 20 years ago. What is it close to? How many people, things like that? Yeah. Uh, McNary County is sort of in the South, uh, West corner, uh, uh of West Tennessee. Uh, there's a little sliver of Hardin County, uh, up against the river, uh, that, that we uh, sort of back up against, uh, there. In fact, uh, from Adamsville, my hometown, the, the, the city limits, uh, to the Tennessee river is about four miles. I mean, so that's, uh, that's how close we are to the Tennessee river. Uh, but, uh, landlocked except for, uh, the, the Hatchie, uh, sort of just to the, just uh, to the west of, <clears throat> of the county, comes down into Hardeman County on our west side, and uh, um, uh, it's a farm community. You know, it's a, it's a traditionally a farm community, like a lot of communities in, in West Tennessee. Uh, the population now about twenty five thousand. Uh, Selmer, uh, this is the county seat, about five thousand uh, uh, folks in Selmer, uh, and so it's a good uh, close knit uh, community. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a, with us incredibly rich uh cultural heritage uh uh that uh, that we've tapped into and and been mining and scratching around in uh now for a long time uh but uh the the contemporary uh art scene uh, uh was practically non-existent you know at the time there were arts programs in the schools uh there had been an attempt years ago back in the 70s to, to start an arts council which was kind of a uh, non-starter it never really got off the ground uh but as far as any sort of arts agency in the county uh, that provided any programming uh on a regular basis there wasn't you know there you know, there were private individuals uh, sometimes you know offering uh, various things art lessons stephen foster music club which is the second oldest federated music club in the state of tennessee was in selmer and it was you know a ladies club uh, which did regular me- uh, meetings and promoted music education and things like that. So there was a little bit of infrastructure uh, like that, but uh, that was again a private club. There was nobody sort of uh, you know serving the public interest uh, as far as the arts w- were concerned as a nonprofit or any leg of city or county government or anything like that. So uh, so that was uh, sort of how we we found it, uh, and um, we. We had a, at the time, of course, it started a successful business here and had been in practice for uh, several years, long enough to, you know, get a feel. And since this is my home county, I was already well aware of a lot of the history of the county and things like that. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, we were uh, we were looking to, to do something and I was involved in some other community groups. Joanna was, too. Um, and so we floated the idea around actually uh initially uh we felt like uh um former an arts council would be uh, a good thing to do and ask the chamber leadership class i was involved in the leadership class at that time about starting uh, you know an arts agency and they felt like it might be too big uh, to tackle uh and in retrospect it was a pretty big project uh um you know for but people didn't know what they were doing uh and so we uh backed up and began to lay a better groundwork did some research called some folks and asked around you know people who had done 
similar things in the past. And uh, it's been about a year you know, laying the groundwork uh, before we started actually uh, forming a board and doing all the you know, formal things, you know, charter, you know, drafting bylaws and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so it, it, that's sort of where it be, began uh, is just, uh, you know, looking at the community, seeing a need uh, and, uh, and just really trying to see what you could do about filling that need. So you, um, you know, kick this idea around publicly. Did you have any naysayers or was everybody in the whole community immediately on board? Well, I bet you know the answer to the question. Uh, there's there's always naysayers, right? Uh, there was nobody who just stood in direct opposition to what we were trying to do. Uh, but, but uh, you know, there's always people saying, well, uh, I'm not sure. And so there's a little bit of that. So how did you continue to push the idea forward in spite of the occasional, I don't think that's a good idea, is that you were getting periodically? Well, uh, but we uh, went to the community and we uh, did a series of community meetings uh, and just invited anybody who was interested in talking about this. Good, bad, indifferent. If you want to talk about it, we want to you know, get ideas. We want to we want to uh, get the community together and begin to see uh, what we think is possible. So we had a series of, uh, of public meetings uh, where we had folks come in and talk about it. And even though there were some, you know, you know some opinions about what you know, war, would work and uh, and not work. Uh, we uh, we started with uh, uh, I think a really good open minded uh, uh, group of people who had the flexibility to move forward and say, well, if it doesn't work, it, it doesn't work. If this doesn't work, we try something else. And so that kind of that kind of um, uh, uh, almost um, I wouldn't say cavalier attitude, but uh, but uh, you, you know the open mindedness to say, well. You know, we've got nothing to lose here. You know, uh, so if we try and fail, well, we'll try something else and see what works. And so we felt our way along uh, initially going that way. Uh, and very fortunately, uh, you know, uh, we found good community support for almost everything uh, that uh, we thought through. And uh, we adopted some some ideas uh, early on uh, that would form sort of the culture of the organization, like let's only do what we are, um, are sure we can uh, do. Uh, let's, let's make sure that, you know, we do it the right way. Let's make sure, you know, that we're, uh, that we're responding to the community needs. Let's make sure we're listening, uh, you know, to, to, to the creative community about what their needs are. And so uh, we started with, you know, a pretty good set of core principles uh, that guided us. And so uh, the four initial program uh, um Committees, uh, which you added to since, but were performing arts, visual arts, uh, music, and literature. And we, in the first couple of years, did programs uh, in all of those disciplines, which were uh, well received by the community, uh, supported in um, uh, in every way we could have dreamed. And so uh, it just built from those those four, and we've added you know program committees uh, since then that uh, um, work in other artistic disciplines. And then I know um, Rockabilly play, played in a little bit into your success. Can you talk about McNary County and the impact of Rockabilly? Yeah, and uh, that's uh, that's sort of in my wheelhouse, I guess. That when uh, uh, when we started, uh, um, we realized pretty early on that. Uh, we had not paid uh, an awful lot of attention to what was already here. Uh, we were sitting in the, uh, my living room with uh, uh, the board of directors uh, in the first few years, and uh, we were just having sort of an informal um, reception, you know, uh, with the board and a little planning session. And so I asked the question, well, so uh, we got this, we got this statement in our bylaws that says that we're all about uh, you know, preserving and promoting cultural strengths of McNary County. So what are those? Uh, and uh, so, you know, there's crickets uh, in the room and everybody's looking at each other. And when people started naming things, they were naming things that we had done, uh, that the arts agency had, had uh, started. And so, you know, we knew intuitively that those couldn't be the cultural strengths of McNary County because they were five years old and we'd, we'd only been doing them. And so that led to a little bit uh, um 
of a quest for better answers and uh, uh, scratching beneath the surface. And so that's where we came forward with a lot of this music heritage uh, stuff, some of the things that had gone on, you know, in this county. Uh, a couple of examples that you'd ask about the rockabilly thing specifically. There's a great old time and bluegrass music heritage here. Uh, a little bit, little bit uh, of uh, uh, some some other uh, types of music, uh, but uh, the rockabilly thing loomed pretty large when we were uh, when we were going through that, dating back to the late '40s, early '50s. You know, Carl Perkins made his first recordings of his career in Eastview, Tennessee, which is right down uh, the road here on the count, uh, near the Mississippi State Line. That was 1951. Uh, you know, before he he was Carl Perkins of Sun Records fame and Blue Suede Shoes fame and all that, and um, he was uh, in and out of this area all the time. There was a big music jam down at the Latta uh, Ford Motor Company, which is now our cultural center, uh, where, you know, Carl would show up and all these other pickers would show up and they'd have these big jams on the weekend and uh, that kind of thing. Dewey Phillips, uh, undisputed first, uh, you know, rock and roll DJ, Red Hot and uh, Blue, uh, you know, Memphis WHBQ, hail from Adamsville, Tennessee, uh, you know, my hometown uh, in the eastern part of the county. Uh, uh, Things like that. Uh, uh, one of Elvis's first road gigs was at Bethel Springs uh, at the at a you know high school auditorium in Bethel Springs, Tennessee, where he met Carl Perkins for the first time. And they talked about Sun Records. So there's all these little fascinating tidbits of history mixed in with a really deep and rich uh, you know old time music heritage here, uh, uh, which sort of led to uh, saying, well, what do you do with that? I mean, once you know that, uh, you've got that. Uh, information in front of you, you know, how does the community benefit from it? Like, what do, how do we program around it? And so that led to a lot of interesting things, including what are now uh, pretty two iconic uh, murals in downtown summer that uh, capture some of that period music history and the festival, uh, uh, which is in uh, first week in June, downtown summer music festival, Rockabilly Highway Revival. Uh, and uh, um, uh some of the discovery of the Little John recordings, including the Carl Perkins uh, material, has led in some interesting uh, directions too. We we uh, were able to produce a uh, uh, a record just in 2019 with those Carl Perkins recordings. First time anybody had ever heard of them outside of a small group of people like uh, eggheads, like myself and folklore uh, people, uh, either interested in this stuff. So all that has been a, a huge shot in the arm uh, for local tourism development, uh, cultural tourism, as well as just pride of place, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, I think people, you know, now identify this community with some of that stuff, you know, some of the some of the early rockabilly and um, uh, the festival and uh, the Perkins recordings and the murals, uh, which have uh, been seen now internationally. Tissic tourism gets a lot of mileage out of those. Uh, those two murals, which are by Brian Toll, who's a local artist who grew up here in McNary County, uh, but he's a very uh, highly sought after, respected uh, artist now, lives in Nashville. He's represented in galleries in Naples, Florida, and Nashville. And, uh, he's just a fantastic uh, artist who's developed his second career as a muralist uh, now. And so as a local boy, of course, everybody loves that 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 part of it too. So uh, it's it's been a really an interesting journey, you know, following th these uh, cultural pieces, uh, you know, that we found during a, a cultural assessment effort. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked about the wrong Billy thing, because of course I love to talk about that. And what's funny is a lot of that would have possibly lay, lay dormant if you hadn't have brought it up and asked the question and dug a little deeper and figured out what assets do we have in our community. Um, yeah. I love that um, that your uh, principle um, that you're founded on is that participation in the arts is a cornerstone for the development of a healthy community. And yeah. you've mentioned a little bit of it. What are some other wins that you've seen the arts provide there in McNary County in recent years? Yeah. Uh the uh, uh, I mentioned uh, earlier the the cultural center, uh, which has been a, a great boon for us as well. Uh, you know, a lot of that was based on a strong track record uh, uh, that we already had doing community arts programming as as vagabonds. But that has really become a, a, a you know as a home of arts and Mary, that's become a, a real cornerstone um, and a draw for for this area uh, and a hub for arts programming. Uh, the um, uh, 
the community theater program has just uh, gone like gangbusters and from the day from from day one uh, that took off. And you know they they do a half a dozen shows uh, as soon as one wraps. They're in rehears- uh, auditions and rehearsals for the next one. That's that's drawn people uh, you know from all over the region. We have people come up from North Mississippi. Uh, you know I, I love to tell stories. I, I, I met a couple going out one night at the theater. They came for a dinner theater, and they said to me, you know we used to go to Memphis. Uh, uh, and do this. We'd take a weekend and we'd go to Memphis and there's two couples, two older couples and uh, we'd spend the weekend in Memphis and we'd shop and we'd do whatever and we'd go go to a show uh, and, you know, and then you know, and go home. She goes, well, now we can come here. And she's coming to Selmer, Tennessee, 5,000 folks and she's, oh, we'd love to go to Hockaday Hand and make rooms and we'd love to go over to Shiloh National Military Park. We're in town. This is just a really charming little town. We just love it here and that started naming the restaurants they liked in the area and that kind of thing. So, you know, not only has it been a success for the, uh, for the people who participate, especially kids you know, who grow in a community where they just now expect that there's going to be quality community theater happening in their community. They can audition. You know, we, we've seen that transform lives. Kids go to school and scholarships, uh, you know, theater uh, scholarships who you know previously had no exposure, you know, to that kind of thing until it was right in their backyard. It's also been a, you know, a great thing for the community. You, know, you talk about, you know, cultural tourism revenues, you know, those people come in and spend the night and go to the show, and, you know, and uh, buy your gas and eat your food. You know, uh, those, uh, uh, you know, we participated in um, or uh, AEP five a few years ago, which is the Arts and Economic Prosperity Five, you know, to, uh, to assess those uh, numbers, and they're astounding. I mean, they're astounding what a small arts agency, you know, can do for a community in terms of improving tax revenues from all that cultural tourism money that starts to, you know, get into the registers when you do these these sorts of things. So that's been great. The center there, where we're, we're always having... There's always an exhibit from a local or regional artist uh, in that, you know, people come in for that. That's been hugely successful as well. Uh, you know, they're uh, just with, over the weekend went to an author signing, a young lady from uh, North Mississippi uh, just published, um, you know, a book and they had a signing for her. And, you know, people come in and meet the author, you know, get, uh, uh, she does a little gallery talk. We do this, uh, all that sort of thing. In addition to, um, all, all the the, ex- the other exhibitions, the cultural exhibitions, and uh, things uh, things like that uh, that, that we have, uh, it's just you know there, there's no downside to any of it. Uh, so your and, your theater, it, an art gallery, a publishing house, a community history and heritage center, you have all these things going on. Um, right. Do you? Do you have uh, managers, leaders? Do you have people working at each one of these? Yeah, and you know, the important to say, I guess, about this is that this is a completely volunteer-driven organization, uh, and that uh, there's a board of directors, uh, you know, which uh, you know has fiduciary uh, uh, oversight. Uh, but then each one of the uh, disciplines that I just mentioned, from the community theater to the folk life to uh, you know the visual arts, uh, is a committee chair who actually sits on the board of directors. Uh, and then is the envoy between the people doing that work in the community and the board. So the funding comes down uh, from the board, and uh, uh, and, uh, and we're not trying to invent the arts uh, or reinvent the arts. Uh, we respond into what's happening in the community, and so in each one of those areas, when people come and say, "Hey, you know, this happened recently," we had some uh, young woman said, "You know, we don't do any film in this community. We don't like to do some film, and we've got a place to do it. We've got that great theater." sitting right there. So uh, why can't we do film? Well, why can't we? You want to do it? Sure. I want to do it. So start a film festival. Okay. And so now we have a media arts um, a committee, uh, uh, which uh, does, does an annual film festival uh, where they have, you know, local uh, um uh, filmmakers, regional filmmakers now, it's getting bigger every year. We're getting submissions from, you know, out of state. And uh, and so these are screened and awarded, uh, you know, at, uh, at, a, at a film festival. But that, that was all the community saying, we don't do film. Well, why don't we do film? Well, we can do film. Who wants to do it, right? And so uh, uh, each each artistic discipline has its own uh, committee chair who organizes a committee around whatever activities they uh, uh, want to do uh, in relation to, uh, you know, that particular artistic uh, discipline. So uh, all volunteer, but uh, it, it, it works, you know, uh, 
like clockwork sometimes like clockwork with sand in the gears but it but it still works right <laughs> well i know that uh there's a lot of folks listening who live in rural communities who may be city planners or may just be volunteers in their community and they're all salivating over what you're talking about we're going to take a quick break and when we get back i'm going to ask you for a few little tips and tricks for those who are listening who want to try to replicate this in their own communities The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who call West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner, and the last home of blues pioneers Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtnheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying Real Foot Forward, the podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be certain that you subscribe, rate, and leave positive reviews only on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Dr. Sean Pitts. Um, He's done a lot of things, but I guess for the sake of our conversation, he's a cultural planner and community arts advocate. Um, And so he's going to give us a few tips Um, suggestions, tricks for those of us who want to see something like this replicated in our own communities. So what do we do? Uh, Yeah, so I think the first thing is to know your community. Uh, And uh, I've done a little consulting work where I've worked with other communities trying to do this uh, sort of work. And uh, uh, people try to do it a lot of ways. Uh, the worst way to, uh, to do it uh, is to think that uh, you know you can come in to a rural community and we're going to art up the locals, right? That's 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 the, the that's the thing. We're gonna we're gonna sort of use some sort of template and slap it on this community. And uh, but there's no arts agency in a box. You have to know your community. You have to know what the needs are. You have to know who the creative people are in your community. Who are your allies? Uh, so that's the one of the first things I tell people. You know when they when they start this is is point a broad-based coalition uh, of people, you know, who have an interest in, who are your natural partners in, you know, community development uh, of this sort. Uh, and I'm a big advocate of uh, what's now uh, called, uh, you know, cultural asset mapping, uh, uh, and uh, uh, goes by a few other names as well. But basically. Uh, what you're looking at doing is sitting down with the stakeholders in your community uh, and saying, what's important to us? Uh, what what does our culture look like naturally? What do we already have to build on? Um, and then where are the needs? You know, where where are our blind spots? Where are, you know, our um, uh, perhaps holes that should be filled in uh, uh, and uh, understanding the community again is is sort of the I think pivotal step. You know, we we looked into that. Uh, uh, we we as I mentioned, you know, earlier, we didn't know what we were doing. We we're making it up as we went along. But one of the right decisions we made uh, was this business about consulting the community uh, on on what it is they want, what it is they need, uh, uh, and where it is. You know, where where have, where did we come from? You know, and uh, those are important questions I ask uh, up front. If that makes any sense. Well, and I do like uh, somewhere I read where you, one of the things that inspired the work that you do today was speaking to a group of young people and saying, what do we love about our hometown? Right. And they said. Nothing. (laughs) Yeah. I speak to to the, you know, youth leadership classes in that, you know, I've been doing it for years and and on the front end, you know, I've I've written an article uh, that you referenced there that, that I mentioned that. Uh, I would ask the question you know, always on the front end. I would say to this group of young, bright young people, you know, who are juniors and seniors uh, in our uh, county schools, uh, uh, tell me one thing you love about this community. And usually it was nothing, you know, just absolutely, you know, almost reviling, you know, the the community. And, and when uh, they're gone, they're not coming back if they can't right. think of a, of a good thing about where they're living. That's right. That's right. And so. You know, uh, uh, after we did a lot of this 
groundwork and we begin to do some things in this community, I witnessed over the course of the years, uh, those questions uh, uh, looked a lot uh, different. Okay. The, the answers were coming back to me. Uh, not so much. We had, I mean, look, you know, uh, everybody understands who's ever lived in a rural community that's shopping and dining and uh, cultural amenities and, you know, in larger cities are always going to be a draw. And that's cool. You know, uh, uh, we we all we all do that. And that's fine. But if you can't find one reason uh, you know, to love your community or to redeem it, uh, you know, you are in trouble. So we've seen those answers change a lot, especially with some of the uh, cultural activity that's happening here. Now, when I ask that question, you know, I get uh, I get uh, answers that sound like, you know, uh, um, something that you can work with. Uh, people get saying that, oh, the music heritage is so cool here. And, you know, that, mur- you know, Mural 2 is my favorite. And, you know, and so, you know, they find a reason to, to actually be proud of this, you know, community. And, uh, and uh, even though they may not come back here, uh, I can cite a number of instances uh, where they actually have. I had a uh, uh, had a young woman tell me not long ago that when, uh, after she got out of school, one of the reasons that she decided to come back here and raise her family is because she had had a great growing up experience, uh, you know, uh, plugged into the cultural uh, community here, plugged into the artistic community here. And, and so, and also just retirees, uh, you know, nobody wants to go to a place that has nothing going on, but if you've got all the small town charm uh, in a lot of these places that we live in rural uh, places, and you can augment that uh, with a strong uh, cultural uh, appeal uh, from either the historical cultural features or what's happening now in your community theater and your your art showings, all of that stuff. It's very attractive, you know, to retirees. Property values are, are right, taxes are right, uh, and now if you've got a great community that you can enjoy and plug into too, you know, that's a real advantage uh, for communities. Well, I read I read where uh, the work that you and the rest of the volunteers in your community are doing, you've created a unique cultural asset that has sparked economic growth and helped it forge a new, stronger identity. So I'm curious, uh, 20 years after you started, uh, mm-hmm. what is the identity of McNary County now? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, uh, if you'd ask uh, that 20 years ago, most people would have said Buford Pusser, which has been a great asset for, you know, the uh, the Walk and Tall movies and all of that. Still a great asset for McNair. There's a museum over in Adamsville, but that was basically the the identity of the community was the, the Walking Tall Buford Pusser uh, legacy. And that's still a strong part of the local identity. And you'd be foolish to throw away something that's, you know, that has been that uh, good for uh, the community. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, now, I think a lot of people think about uh, the music heritage of this community. And just as an example, uh, when uh, when we uh, when we really first got um, it, it in gear with some of the cultural tourism stuff, the, the music heritage and the downtown improvements, there wasn't a lot happening in downtown. Uh, but in a matter of a few years, we painted two world-class murals in downtown. Uh, put in a walking trail, which talks about all of these figures who were imported in the music heritage, put a $1.5 million cultural center uh, in the heart of our downtown. Uh, and and downtown uh, looks way different than it did 20 years ago. There's, there's almost no uh, empty storefronts now, and they were uh, they were everywhere. Now, uh, it's hard to say that's the only thing that was happening in in, uh, in summer. We had good leadership at the county level, and had good city leaders, and they made good, wise decisions and partnered with us and a lot of these things. But it is fair to say that, you know, that a lot of that concentration on uh, who are we as a community, what's important to us, what do we want our identity to be? Uh, you know, has paid dividends, uh, you know, over the long haul. And it's fair to say that, uh, you know, the c- entire county, but especially, uh, you know, downtown Selmer look, uh, looks um, way different than it did 20 years ago, way better uh, than it did 20 years ago. It's provided all kinds of economic opportunity. You know, Rockabilly Cafe, Cafe came along across from one of the murals and people start putting in related businesses and things like this. Uh, so people, you know, just reinvesting in their community because there's a, that pride in the community begins to reemerge and that's that's hard to to um overstate how important that is you know for a small town absolutely so uh discovery park is all about inspiration um you've obviously accomplished a great deal and still continue to what inspires you um every day 
young people. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I'll just say that, you know, it's a great kick uh, uh, for me to go uh, to one of the youth theater productions or uh, or to see people coming up. And I, you know, I hear a lot of garbage nowadays about what's wrong with the kids. There's nothing wrong with the kids. Okay. Uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, my kids are millennials. That's a great generation. I'm tired of hearing millennials kicked around. Uh, uh, every day I get up uh, and I see, you know, uh, the creativity, you know, in, in young people. I see, uh, you know, uh, those uh, these kids who started as, as children in the programs now are, are young adults and they have families. And uh, they're plugged into the leadership uh, of the organization. And so that, you know, that that gets me up uh, uh, in the morning and keeps me going that uh, that uh, we're we're bringing along a whole other generation, you know, to who are interested in their community that and, you know, just telling stories. Every community has a great story to tell uh, if you just look at it in the right way, if you're willing to do the digging, if you're willing to get out there and uh, and find out you know, uh, what those stories are and then, and then retelling those in ways. And that's where a lot of my writing that you mentioned has, has come in that I've drawn inspiration from, you know, the, the music heritage, the material culture here, you know, the handcraft heritage, you know, the history, uh, and that has really informed a lot of the writing, uh, that I've done. So uh, those are, those are two big ones for me, you know, the kids and the stories. So for people who are, uh, interested in learning more, um, about what what all the things you guys are doing, where should they go? Yeah, the best place is probably artsandmcnary dot com. Uh, that's uh, you know, there's uh, information about all of the program and project committees. There's uh, information about the cultural center. There's information about uh, uh, and links to our uh, local music hall of fame and trail of music legends. So there, uh, you know, it's the the website. Gives all the information you could ever need. You can buy tickets to upcoming events there. You got a jazz concert coming up this weekend, uh, and uh, so you know uh, there's always something going on. The website's usually uh, updated, or you know Facebook Arts McNary, Instagram Arts McNary, uh, probably the best sources for you know information as it's developing and, and coming out. So uh, yeah, I invite everybody to skip on over there and take a look and uh, and uh, give us a shout. You know, uh, come see us. Well, congratulations on 20 years and uh, kudos. I'm personally jealous of all the great stuff you guys have have generated. And I know I speak on behalf of a lot of people out there who say, you know, we'd love to see this replicated in our own community. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I just really enjoy uh, to talk about this stuff. And I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity uh, to come on. Yeah, you bet. And thank you to all you listeners who've joined Dr. Pitts, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.